In this video, we will talk about rapid prototyping, and uh, you will see by the end what that means. Um, we will talk about rapid prototyping with PDMS, uh, with, 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 uh, with polymers, and uh, mainly with PDMS. We will talk about milling, and we will talk about uh, uh, papers and, uh, and screen printing on paper uh, and making microfluidics as such. So rapid prototyping is a way to quickly get to your prototypes. That's uh, where the name comes from. Um, so what's the process of uh, microfluidic chip design? It's kind of like the process of designing anything in, in engineering nowadays, but uh, you can look at it two ways. Uh, one of them is a, is a grossly simplified diagram. The other one is uh, slightly more uh, uh, industry relevant representation. But in any case, how it begins is by specifications. You get the, the specifications that you need to work with. The chip has to do this, it has to do that, it has to be this size, and so on. Then you do computer-aided design. And then this is where uh, our colleague who did this, uh, link is down here, um, deviates from uh, my approach, I would say. First you make a prototype, and that is why rapid prototyping is important. And only then you start uh, iteratively testing and simulating. And here, simulation comes first. Different approaches. Uh, my physics uh, professor told me that uh, if your model doesn't match reality, then you change the model and not reality. So uh, typically, uh, you first would need to make a physical uh, device if it's possible and then fit the model to that. And then from the model make extrapolations or make slight uh, fine tuning to the, the design. We will talk about uh, what simulation can do in another lecture. So then uh, this part is done, uh, prototyping simulation, uh, testing and design optimization. That's what happens. And uh, so this, this uh, iterative optimization uh, now we are here. It means that you change the design bit by bit until you get to the point where you match the specifications. And uh, yeah, this diagram looks a little weird. Admittedly, yes, it just had to fit onto one screen, so that's why it looks like, like such. But uh, each time you make a change, you need to check again against your specifications. Have I met them? If not, then go to the next cycle, change something again, then try again, and try again. And uh, with the simulation, you can have an additional tool in your uh, tool chain to, uh, to make it happen, and to make it happen fast, and uh, to, to simulate the effects of uh, some changes that you make to the geometry. Then, once uh, you are done, and uh, you have your, uh, your final design, and you are able to meet the specifications, then you go to fabrication. And by fabrication, here we can mean uh, microfabrication, for instance, or something that is expensive and high quality. And then the rest uh, that is not the part of this uh, lecture, so let's not uh, talk about that, but that's basically when production begins uh, with, with uh, tested and finalized parts. But now we are at the prototyping level. So you have an idea, you have the specifications, you make your first design, you make your first prototype, what do you do? Uh, you can choose polymers, you should choose polymers because uh, they are advantageous um, in many ways. They are cheap, uh, and, and this is especially true in mass production for something like uh, the very common pregnancy tests. Uh, these plastics are extremely cheap, the, the housing that is around uh, such tests. Um, even less than one, one, one or two euros. This is for a really complex uh, microfluidic chip design. So something large and, uh, and complicated can go up to one to two euros in uh, massive quantities. They are easy to machine. Uh, they are optically transparent if it's necessary. They have good thermal and electrical properties. High aspect ratio for microstructures. 
plastics can be biocompatible and uh, it is also possible to, to have options for recycling. So you can use uh, PLA, for instance, polylactic acid for injection molding. But there are other ways of fabrication, not just injection molding. In this lecture, we will focus on uh, PDMS and plastics. So the chip, again, just uh, as a reminder, is uh, in the submillimeter domain. Channels are typically a uh, couple hundred microns across. The chip itself is in the square centimeter range. So this one would be uh, a typical um, uh, chip size that you, that you see here. And look at the scale. And uh, under polymers, we usually talk about PDMS and plastics. And these are very commonly used plastics. So uh, cyclic olefin copolymer, polycarbonate, PMMA is uh, acrylic glass or polymethyl methacrylate. Fabrication techniques, soft lithography, uh, we will talk about that. That's only for PDMS. Milling or machining, uh, we talk about that too. The other two things, next lecture. Um, well, not, not the next lecture, but the Fabrication 2 lecture. Uh, if we talk about microfluidic chip uh, layer structures, then there can be different uh, types of chips. Uh, monolithic would mean that uh, all features are formed uh, in the same substrate. Um, however, I don't think this is very common, to be honest. Uh, it's only really possible with uh, 3D printing to do it like this. Uh, Multilayer, this is really what you will uh, see most often, where you have a, a, a layer which is patterned and contains the bulk of the chip, the microfluidic channels, and then you have a sealing layer, which uh, the only purpose of which is to seal the channels inside your uh, bulk uh, layer or inside the, the chip layer. Now, uh, soft lithography. So again, this is very much like stamping. But how it works is um, first you need to produce your master. So first thing you do is, uh, is actually just regular lithography that uh, you, make, uh, you make your microstructure uh, on a photosensitive uh, or from a photosensitive material. And uh, we can look at how that is made. So you start with uh, your substrate, typically silicon, and uh, you coat it usually with, uh, with uh, centrifugation. So it is called spin coating, where the, the wafer is attached uh, to a vacuum chuck and you pour on uh, the, the liquid uh, resin, the, the resist, that is a photosensitive material. And by uh, spinning um, or by centrifugation, the, the resist will even be spread out on uh, the, the wafer. And then this chromium mask is uh, fabricated to have the negative or the positive of the channels that you want to, uh, to create. And, uh, and so what it means is that you have a glass uh, uh, wafer and on, onto that glass uh, chromium is, uh, is uh, evaporated and selectively patterned to make windows through which you expose your photoresist to light. And then depending on the kind of resist, uh, the exposed layer becomes uh, soluble or insoluble. In any case, after uh, uh, treatment with your solvent, what remains is the negative of your uh, channel structure. And then this is where the soft lithography actually begins. You pour on uh, the PDMS elastomer, remember, mixed with the curing agent. Then you vacuum it out. Typically, usually, typically apply heat to it to, uh, to uh, speed up the curing process, and then it cures. And then you remove it, and then you stick it to your uh, sealing layer, which is uh, either another silicon wafer or glass. And uh, there you go. You have your chip, which looks like this. And uh, the mask itself, 
So this uh, this mask doesn't necessarily need to be made of uh, of chromium glass. It can also be made from plastics by milling, 3D printing, or hot embossing. That is also totally valid. Milling. It's not very complicated. Milling is basically just a drill hung up on a three-axis or or multi-axis uh, robotic arm or robotic frame. So um, it is a rotary cutter, and uh, this is a, this is the cutting head that spins at a very high speed. And um, some cutting fluid is dispensed uh, to uh, to to help uh, cool down the the drill head. Cutting fluid can mean air, it can also mean liquids, whatever the, the process needs. The spindle has the drill bit, the, the cutter uh, attached to it. And then what we have in our department is uh, an M7HP Dotron uh, CNC machine. So it's computer controlled uh, uh, milling. And uh, yeah, the, the word CNC stands for Computer Numerical Control. But um, the one we have is three axis. In the industry, they have uh, up to six uh, axes. Uh, so the head can also tilt in various directions to cut out uh, even more complex structures. We only have three axes to work with. That means you can make uh, really nice holes, but you're not able to reach under uh, your structure that is only possible for us by 3d printing look at this video at home um, and then check out how this uh, milling process works maximum resolution is determined by the precision of the stepper motor of the robotic frame uh, size of the drill bit and uh, the substrate properties so the material uh, properties that that you cut uh, the input that you need to provide is a CAD file and of course, uh, what you need to get cut. But um, after that, uh, somebody who, who knows how to work with uh, milling machines needs to also make the CAM file, which defines uh, the, the drill speeds and, uh, and so on. So paper microfluidics, uh, interesting topic. Uh, like I said, mostly uh, confined to research at the moment. So this, what we talk about here is uh, screen printed uh, paper microfluidics where you start with paper that has a high absorbance uh, for water or high, it's highly absorbing to water. Then you apply wax as a hydrophobic layer and uh, by applying heat you uh, bake it in and this is what you get. So it's, um, it's wax coated and uh, oh no, sorry, uh, this is the wax coating and that gives the outline of your uh, uh, channels and uh, inside is your regular uh, uh, water absorbent paper that uh, can spread your water the way you would like it to and the width of your paper strip also defines uh, the the velocity of your flow. So reasons to use paper are that uh, it is really cheap. Uh, we're talking about a few cents per uh, chip. It is easy to manufacture and uh, it is highly disposable. The problem is that it's not really standardized and uh, at the moment the reproducibility, the repeatability is questionable. So typically as I said, uh, a porous paper membrane is used uh, as the starting layer, uh, which has a, a high, which is highly absorbing uh, or absorbent uh, towards water. And then you screen print uh, wax barriers, you bake them in, and then you can also uh, screen print electrodes. And you can check out this video about uh, uh, one such uh, example system. Now. Um, you can do two-dimensional networks with this and as I mentioned before, the, the length and the width of these uh, paper channels um, determines the, the speed, the rate at which uh, 
the flows uh, or the, the flow velocity in uh, in these uh, systems and one more advantage to to doing things on paper is that you can immobilize reagents on the paper so that uh, when you rewet this paper you can uh, uh, wash away these reagents and uh, you know, like say you add the sample liquid sample and uh, the sample itself washes out the reagents and uh, and does the reaction that that you want to do so two-dimensional paper network is uh, what you have up here as a, as an example and uh, the dry reagents that are immobilized in the paper membrane are rehydrated by addition of uh, the sample and or the buffer and then but here this is only a color reaction to give you uh, an example of uh, of how it looks like and uh, but this could be an actual uh, uh, reaction so what can you do with this well uh, one thing that you surely know is uh, uh, the glucometers um, that is very close to the working principle of uh, uh, two-dimensional paper uh, network microfluidics but um, so much so that in uh, this paper they used uh, a glucometer to read their own custom uh, system with an electrochemical sensor and so mostly what you can do with this is uh, immunoassays where uh, you detect antibodies um, that are normally produced by your immune system against uh, biological targets. After the last two years, I'm pretty sure everyone has heard about antibodies too. Um, so they are produced against uh, uh, different uh, pathogens, for instance. So by immobilizing the antigen that uh, provokes the immune response onto a membrane, um, and adding the sample the, from your sample, like blood for instance, antibodies will bind to your detection zone or to your reaction zone and then uh, can be moved on to the detection zone and from the detection zone they can be detected. And uh, another example uh, down here, so this uh, network of which uh, you saw a, a picture in the last slide that is for uh, malaria uh, detection and uh, it was demonstrated as such but this is, is down here it's for uh, for optical detection and um, if you want to try this at home you can you don't really need anything special well getting microscope slides might be a bit special but if you can get your hands on microscope slides then uh, you can use a permanent marker to draw your uh, microfluidic network and just uh, uh, put some water onto this slide and the capillary effect will take care of the rest. Uh, the liquid will spread out inside this channel network. I tried it, it works. You can also use scotch tape to uh, mold PDMS. So you can uh, again take a glass slide, uh, cut out uh, from scotch tape some microfluidic structures and then you can mold uh, PDMS like you normally would and it works as a master mold so these things uh, and also check out this video on uh, homemade microfluidics it's a fun thing to try if you would like to but uh, in the lab you can try uh, professional uh, microfluidics uh, but this is good for uh, for a first contact so in this lecture in this uh, video, we talked about uh, rapid prototyping of, uh, of uh, polymer microfluidics, mainly PDMS. We talked about uh, milling of plastics. And we also talked about uh, paper microfluidics and screen printing. Mm -hmm.